Welcome to the lecture Principles of Quantum Chemistry CHM322 What let me quickly revise what we have seen so far The initial model that we ended up uh, understanding was particle in a one dimension box which we revised a few classes back where if a free particle keeps moving uh, between a given confines of a well where the potential outside the well is infinity we were able to deduce that the wave function of such a case is going to be given by square root of 2 by a sin n pi x by a where the values of n go from 1 2 3 and so on in integral uh, increments where the energy is given by n square h square by 8 ma square and the degeneracy in this case was all states are singly degenerate after having understood this the next system that we ended up uh, understanding was the harmonic oscillator so when two bodies m1 and m2 are connected by a bond we were trying to understand how the vibrations would play a role meaning that how far would the bond go away uh, from the mean equilibrium distance and in this case we were once again setting up the time independent Schrodinger's equation and after having set that up we learned two different methodologies in order to understand how this could be solved one was the numerical way while the other was the uh, algebraic way after having done this uh, we came up with an expression that looks like this where psi n is given by a normalization constant hn nn sorry and with a hermit polynomial as a function of alpha power half x times e for e power minus alpha x square by 2 where the normalization constant nn is given by 1 over 2 power n n factorial with a half times pi by alpha power 1 by 4 and these hermit polynomials could be deduced such that hn is given by minus 1 power n e power alpha x square by 2 uh, dn by dx power n e power minus x square by 2 and in this case we might remember alpha is mk by h cross square power 1 by 2 and most importantly we understood that en is given by h bar omega times n plus half where n goes from 0 1 2 3 and so on here as well the gn is singly degenerate okay after having done this the next thing that we understood is that if a particle goes in a ring let's say of mass m in this case we set up uh, equations which started with the Hamiltonian in the form of x and y however this was later converted into r and theta where r is a constant that is the uh, radius of the ring and this became reduced to dou square by dou theta square if you might remember after having done this the next thing that we did here was to find uh, uh, was to solve this where the psi n was given by 1 over square root of 2 pi which is a normalization constant e power i m phi where the value of m goes between 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 plus minus 3 and so on um, such that the degeneracy of m is equal to 1 when m equal to 0 is doubly degenerate when m is greater than 0 in this case the energy was given by m square h cross square by 2i where i is the moment of inertia so these were the different models that we had learned so far so after having done this the next step that we need to go towards is to understand the rigid rotor model the rigid rotor model helps you understand how bond rotations uh, can be modeled 
So what do we mean by that? Let's say we have two bodies, M1 and M2, that are connected by a bond. In this case, we assume no vibrations happen, just as a starting model assumption. When you have something like this, where the bond distance is given by R, you're trying to understand how, when this bond ends up rotating across every possible axis, uh, what are the wave functions that end up coming when you're having something like a quantum rigid rotor. The first thing that comes to our mind is that when you have two masses, M1 and M2, that are connected with each other, the first idea that comes up is to understand what kind of rotations will happen and about what axis. So the first thing that uh, we will be reminded of is the center of mass, where the center of mass is determined by how heavy these two are. So basically, let's assume the center of mass is here. So the rotation about this bond will happen about the center of mass. So let's assume the body M1 is about R1 away from the center of mass and the body M2 is away by R2. So the basic premise in which we set up is that M1 R1 equal to M2 R2. Remember R1 plus R2 is equal to R which is the bond distance. So now having said this, the next thing that uh, we would like to deduce here is that how are R1 related to R, uh, R1 and R2 related to R. So the way we would do this is that we can substitute M1 times R minus R2 equal to M2 R2. Then M1 R minus M1 R2 equal to M2 R2. Therefore, m1 r is equal to m1 plus m2 times r2 r2 therefore becomes m1 the whole divided by m1 plus m2 multiplied by r this is an important thing to understand this means that the distance from the center of mass for body 2 which is m2 is given by r2 that depends on actually mass m1, meaning that if m1 is heavier than m2, then r2 is larger. Remember, m1 plus m2 would be a constant for both. And if you patiently derive what is the relationship of r1 to r, you will end up getting this equation. Meaning that if m1 is heavier than m2, therefore m2 is less than uh, m1, then r1 will be smaller. So in this case what we are able to immediately understand is that in this case for m1 greater than m2 r1 is less than r2. So this is not surprising. It's always easy to move the lighter body more than the heavier body. That's the same thing we are able to understand from these equations. Having done this, the next thing that we would like to do is to see what is the kinetic energy that's associated? Kinetic energy K is given by half mv square, in this case half m1 v1 square plus half m2 v2 square. And we know for a fact v equal to r omega for a circular motion where r is the radius and omega is the, not the radius, r is the distance from the center of mass while omega is the angular frequency. So this gets change to m1 r1 square omega square plus m2 r2 square omega square. And we just learnt that the center of mass dictates m1 r1 equal to m2 r2. So that means if I take half m1 r1 out, this will be r1 plus, remember m2 r2 equal to m1 r1, so therefore m1 r1 is out, you just have r2 inside, you get something like this. So therefore, kinetic energy will be given by half m1 r1 where r1 plus r2 is r omega square. I think we can write what is r1 in terms of r which is given by m2 by m1 plus m2 times r which we just deduced a few moments back. Therefore k will be equal to half m1 m2 divided by m1 plus m2 times r square omega square. This entity here is called the reduced mass mu, while this is the bond length and this is the angular frequency at which the circular motion is happening. So therefore, k will be given by half mu r square times omega square. This will be half i omega square. 
we are able to see how this relates to linear motion where in linear motion you had k is equal to px square by 2m so similarly this will be equal to i omega square by 2i where i omega is nothing but the angular momentum so we realize that wherever m was present you convert it to i wherever p was present you convert it to l so now having said that we are able to realize for the kinetic energy for circular motion is given by l square by 2i this is a very important identity which we will end up using in some time so now having said this what is the main conclusion that we can draw um, is that instead of treating two masses here we can treat it as a single mass with a mass of mu with only one body that ends up moving right so instead of two bodies with m1 and m2 with distances r1 and r2 now we have reduced the problem to a single body of reduced mass mu that is given by m1 m2 by m1 plus m2 um, with a uh, with a uh, motion that is described by the distance r. So one important thing is that 1 by mu is given by 1 by m1 plus 1 by m2. So this way we are able to see the reduced mass. Why do we call it reduced mass? Is that it's lowest of the two masses that we end up combining. For instance, if you are imagining something like um, hydrogen and deuterium that are bonded, you will immediately realize the reduced mass 1 by mu would be given by 1 by 1, 1 amu. So this is going to be something like 3 by 2 implies mu equal to 2 by 3. You realize that the mass of this entity is lesser than the uh, uh, lighter atom. So similarly, you can try to do it for C13 and 1h, 12C and 1h, and maybe 12C and 2h. I'm sure you guys would end up doing such substitutions if you would like to know what is the rate kinetics. In the model of uh, the harmonic oscillator, we realize that if we change the isotope, the similar effects could come. So basically what ends up happening, the same equation where you had alpha given by m, you can substitute it with a mu when the masses of the two bodies are put in together. So now having said that, let's get back to the rigid rotor problem what we have done is to reduce the two bodies into a single body so now we are going to enter this picture where it's the Cartesian frame of reference you are trying to look at and you are having the body at a distance r from the origin and then of course we go back to projections where this angle is theta and the angle, sub, the face subtended, subtended on the yz plane is phi with respect to y. So why have we done this? I'm sure you might remember from the example that we ended up doing for a particle in a ring where x and y were converted to r and theta. In this example, we will convert x, y and z into r, theta and phi. Okay, having said this, let's move on. Let's have this picture up there so that we remember. So what ends up happening now is that the Hamiltonian for the rigid rotor, which will be given by h square by 2m, dou square by dou x square, plus dou square by dou y square, plus dou square by dou z square. Now we have to convert this into r, theta and phi. Instead of going through the motions of doing this in a laborious fashion, I would instantaneously give you the answer. So now this will be given as h square by 2m, 1 over r square dou by dou r, r square dou by dou r at constant theta and phi plus 1 over r square sine theta dou by dou theta sine theta dou by dou theta at constant r and phi plus 1 over r square sine square theta dou square by dou phi square at constant r and theta.
So this is essentially what the Hamiltonian gets converted in the R, theta, and phi uh, uh, system, uh, coordinate system. Okay, now after having found this, in this rigid rotor model, we know for a fact that R is going to be invariant. So therefore, the first term here will not be present. So therefore, our Hamiltonian gets reduced to Hamiltonian minus H square by 2M R square. We realize that R square is present in both the cases. So therefore, R square can be taken out. So can be sine theta, but we will hold on, hold off uh, it for a moment. 1 over sine theta, dou by dou theta, sine theta, dou by dou theta. I'm not going to imply r comma phi from now on, so please pay attention. Sine square theta, dou square by dou phi square at constant theta. So this is important because now when we are setting up this rigid rotor model where the potential is zero and the Hamiltonian, as you might remember, is going to be given by the kinetic energy. And we just learned the kinetic energy is nothing but the angular momentum L square divided by 2i. And if you see in the denominator, we have 2 mr square. So immediately, this makes us understand the Hamiltonian is given by, or rather, the angular momentum is now given by everything in this minus h cross square times this entire operator. This is important for us largely because now we can clearly say the Hamiltonian and the L square operator commute with each other. This is important because if two operators commute with each other, they have common set of eigenfunctions, right? So this we have learned before. So now having said this, let's continue with the problem. The problem being, now we'll write it as 2i 1 over sine theta dou over dou theta sine theta dou over dou theta plus 1 over sine square theta dou square over dou phi square times psi is equal to e psi. This is the Schrodinger's time independent Schrodinger's equation. Let's try to quickly rearrange this. So how would we end up doing this? So we would be able to do, let's multiply by sine square theta as well to make our life easy. So what is this going to end up happening? Sine theta, dou by dou theta, sine theta, dou by dou theta, at constant phi, plus dou square by dou phi square, constant theta, times psi is going to be equal to 2ie by h cross square sine square theta times psi. So we can now assume for the sake of simplicity this is given us beta. So now what ends up happening? This is going to be sine theta dou by dou theta with a sine theta dou psi by dou theta at constant phi plus dou square psi by dou phi square at constant theta of course there's a small mistake that has happened basically there is a minus sign here so which will be, if you take it on the other side, plus beta sine square theta psi is equal to 0. Now we should be able to do the separation of variables where I'm going to be representing this is capital theta I'm writing it this way so that one can understand. This is capital phi Okay. So basically, we have been doing this forever where the wave function psi can be written as a product of two functions, capital theta and capital phi. Okay. Now having done this, 
what will end up happening? You are going to have phi that comes out of the first one. So it's going to be capital phi sin theta do by do theta sin theta do capital theta by do theta at constant phi plus capital theta do square capital phi by small phi at constant theta plus beta sin square theta capital theta capital phi is equal to zero. Now having done this, divide the entire equation by capital theta and capital phi. What would this end up happening? This end up doing sin theta by capital theta do by do theta sin theta plus 1 over capital phi do square capital phi divided by do phi square theta plus beta sin square small theta is equal to 0. This is an important step because what we are able to realize is that we have been successfully able to reduce that this term and this term only contain theta while this term contains only phi. So this is great. That means that each of them separately should be equal to a constant, right? This also we have learned several times. So what we end up doing right now is that we tend to say that the phi component is set to minus m square. You can always set it to plus m square as well, but you will see why we have done that. So basically what we have done is that 1 over capital phi do square capital phi by do phi square equal to minus m square. This function might ring a bell. Actually, this uh, differential equation might ring a bell. This is nothing but particle in a ring problem that we solved a little earlier. So therefore, what ends up happening? Instead of going through the rigor, we'll write the solutions right away. So therefore, capital phi will now be given by 1 by square root of 2 pi e power i m phi, where m can take the value of 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, plus minus 3, and so on, where e m will be given by n square m square h cross square by 2 i. This we have seen before, so I'm not taking time to deduce it. So now let's look at the other component, which is sine theta divided by capital theta, dou by dou theta, sine theta, dou capital theta by dou theta, plus beta sine square theta is equal to m square. Why is this equal to plus m square? Because the sum of these two should be equal to 0 as we have seen in this equation. You see the sum of the theta portion and the phi portion should be equal to 0. So therefore if the phi portion is equal to minus m square, the theta portion should be equal to plus m square. Rather than going into finer details of what ends up happening here, we would quickly chase into the solution. If you use the power series method, you might recollect that we understood how the power series method is useful in uh, while we applied it for the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator problem. So similarly, if you apply the power series method, what ends up happening, uh, you'll finally realize the beta value will be set such that beta is L into L plus 1 with values of L going 0, 1, 2, 3 in integral steps of 1. So having done this, immediately one understands we had also said beta equal to 2 ie by h cross square. Okay, so I'll put a little value L here. This implies the energy uh, level for the given quantum number L will be given by h cross square by 2 i L into L plus 1. Remember, this is the uh, energy that ends up coming. This is exactly how you will get L square is given by h cross square L into L plus 1. We have been learning from right from our 11th standard that L is given by h cross times square root of L into L plus 1. This is essentially how you end up getting this important identity. 
So now after having understood this, the next step would be trying to understand how the functions end up coming. Since we have taken this much progress, I would continue the remaining in the following class.